Hello. Hi. I got your uh, resume. Uh, so this is your Java interview, and I'm going to ask you Spring Boot questions as well. Can you briefly introduce your roles and responsibilities along with technical stuff? Mm, yeah. Hi. So now I'm currently having two years of experience, and uh, my technical skill set includes Java, Spring, Spring Boot, and apart from that, I know a little about database. So that is about my skill set. and i'm working as a individual contributor so i'm comfortable with writing java code and rest apis by using spring boot okay so if i ask you to rate uh, yourself in java out of 5 then what what will be your rating uh, if you ask me to rate out of 5 i will try to rate around 4 so i will try to answer at least four questions out of 5 and what about spring boot Out of five, uh, same. I will try to answer at least four questions out of five questions. Okay, so that's uh, that's good, perfect. So let's get uh, started with the interview. Uh, can you tell me what is JVM? Uh, JVM is basically uh, uh stands for Java Virtual Machine, and it comes into picture when you start execution of your program. Let us consider you have compiled your code. and you have generated a class file now you want to execute your program so as soon as you, you start uh, execution that means you type a command something like java space then a uh, class name at that time uh, if you it enter uh, your jvm comes into picture so it is basically used to execute your program all right perfect uh, can you tell me what are the different types of memory areas Uh, that are allocated by jvm uh, so there are different types of memory areas which are allocated uh, by jvm now uh, one of them is class area so class area basically uh, stores per class structure has a runtime constant pool field method data and the code formatters second is heap area it is the runtime data area in which the memory is allocated to the objects then uh, you have stack so it stores frames it holds your local variables and partial results and plays a part in method annotation and filter so there is uh, one more which is program register which is also called as pc register program counter register it contains the address of the java virtual machine instructions currently being executed and then it contains native method stack so it contains all the native methods which are used in your application So these are the different uh, four or five types of uh, memory areas allocated by JVM. All right, uh, perfect. So can you uh, let me know what is JIT compiler, JIT compiler? Uh, yeah, JIT compiler stands for Just in Time Compiler. Uh, it is basically used to improve uh, the performance of your program execution. It compiles the part of your bytecode that has similar functionality at the same time. That means it executes the code parallelly. and hence it helps to reduce the amount of time uh, required for the compilation hence uh, uh, you can call it as a translator or a compiler uh, from the instruction set of jvm to the instruction set of a specific cpu so it is basically used to improve the performance of your compilation all right all right uh, what is what is the component that loads your class in java uh, do you know what is that component Yeah, it is a class loader. Okay, can you explain a bit more about uh, what is class loader? Uh, yeah. So class loader uh, is basically a subsystem of JVM, uh, which is basically used to load uh, the class files. So whenever we run the Java program, it is loaded by your class loader, and there are different types of class loaders which are available in Java. So uh, different types of class loader includes your bootstrap class loader or extension class loader or a system or you can call it as application class loader. So bootstrap class loader uh, is the class loader uh, which loads your rt dot jar file and that jar file basically contains all the class files of your uh, Java uh, to SE edition like Java standard edition. so it contains the packages or classes which are related to like java.lang package or java.net package or java.util package or java.io package these are the basic packages which are required in day to day programming so this 
uh, loading of this class files is taken care by your bootstrap class loader then extension class loader uh, this is your child class loader of your bootstrap class loader and it loads the jar files which are located inside your uh, lib ext directory so there is a directory when you install uh, jre on your system or jdk on your system uh, it comes with uh, lib slash ext directory and whatever class files which are available inside that ext directory uh, those are loaded by your extension class loader and there is one more which is uh, system class loader or we can call it as application class loader so basically this application class loader is a child class of your uh, extension class loader and it is used to load the class files from your class board. so by default the class board wherever you set it so it loads uh, the class files from your class board. so these are the different uh, class loaders which are available in java all right perfect uh so there are access specifiers do you know what are the different types of access specifiers available in java mm, yeah so there are different types of access specifiers which are available in java like uh, private public default and protected okay uh, so consider an example you have a class uh, a in that class there is one public method and there is one private method so method one is public and method two is private now i create one more class b and that extends from a so i'm using inheritance here and will method one and method two be available in class b if i create object of class b uh, so method one and method two are uh, private methods or are those public methods method one is public method and method two is a private method so if the method is a private then uh, that method won't be available in any other class and if method is a public then that method will be available in your child class so private methods won't be available in child class and that public method will be available in your child class all right uh, perfect so i have given you one uh, scenario in the chat uh, can you copy that scenario okay. uh, it's a program yeah have shared on a pad. Can you see it? Oh uh, yeah, the program is uh, available. So, uh, can you tell me what should be the what will be the output of this uh, code? Okay, so we have class inside that you have written a main method, and then we have written two system data the print present statements. So, in the first statement, uh, it will print fifteen into thirty. That becomes four fifty. Cloud tech. And in second statement, again, it is cloud tech plus 15 into 30. So again, it will print cloud tech 15 into 30. So let me write it for 50 and then cloud tech and then it will print cloud tech for 50. This will be the output of this program. All right, and why why do you think uh, the output is this way? Yeah, so if you see here, uh, we are having multiplication. So this multiplication operator has higher precedence as compared to the plus operator. So first it will perform the multiplication of these two, and then it will append this string uh, with the result set of this. Same thing will happen in second statement. Uh, which are multiplication operator which has higher precedence as compared to the plus operator so first it will perform the operation of multiplication of these two numbers so it will multiply 30 and 15 the result will be 450 and then it will append that string with cloud text so it becomes cloud text for 50. yeah that's uh perfect uh thank you for that uh can you do you know what is serialization in java uh, yeah, so serialization is basically used uh, when you want to transfer your data over the network in the, in the form of bytes or the bits. Uh, it can be used to transfer the state of your object. Can I can an object be serialized if that object does not contain uh, the default constructor? Uh, no, uh, you should have object. Uh, so you should have a class with a default constructor if you want to serialize your data over a network. 
So you cannot uh, do serialization without a default constructor. Okay, so default constructor is mandatory for for uh, serialization. Yes, correct. Default constructor is mandatory. All right, all right. So let's move on to uh, Java A. Uh, do you know what is functional interface in Java? Yeah, so functional interface is basically an interface which contains exactly one method, which is abstract method. You can have non-abstract methods like static methods or default method inside the functional interface, but you should have only one method which is non-abstract method. Sorry, abstract method inside the functional interface. It is also called as single abstract method. It is nothing like SAM interface. Okay. All right. Uh, what are default and static methods uh, with respect to uh, and uh, with respect to a functional interface? Uh, so default methods are basically used to perform a default operation. Uh, let us consider you want to perform some default operations. And, uh, you don't want to implement that particular method everywhere in the class which is going to implement the interface. So you can use default method. Write some default operations inside that, and you can directly use default method without creating object of class. You can directly use class interface name, but default method. Uh, static methods are basically used uh, to uh, write some utility code. Again, okay. static methods can be directly called without creating an object of your class. Actually, uh, default method, uh, you need to create an uh, object of your class and then you need to call it without in case of static method, you don't need to create an object of your class or interface. You can directly use the class name or interface name and call it. Okay, all right. Uh, so let's move on to uh, Spring Boot. What is the difference between Spring and Spring Boot? Uh, so the major difference between Spring and Spring Boot is uh, earlier uh, when we creating when we were creating application by using Spring, we were required to do a lot of configuration by using XML based configuration or maybe a different based configuration, but it was required to write a lot of bidirectional code to bring up the application. But uh, we use Spring Boot application. Uh, you can directly create a Spring Boot application by using Spring Initializer. And uh, your application can be used or it could be a production ready application uh, with minimal code. So you can just use Spring Initializer to write uh, the fields which are required to create a project like uh, dependencies, or other dependencies which are required to have any dependencies or the merger. Then you can provide your kindly artifact kindly and packaging. You can download that package and uh, Extract it into your own of the editor and simply uh, run the file which contains my method. Your application will be up. So you don't need to uh, write the boilerplate code which was required in uh, earlier version of Spring. That is the major difference. And another difference is like uh, in earlier version of Spring, uh, you were required to have uh, Tomcat or any other server to explicitly deploy your Spring application. But that is not the case with Spring Boot. Uh, Spring Boot provides you a default uh, say embedded uh, server like Tomcat or Jetty. <coughs> and that will be uh, used to deploy your Spring Boot uh, application. So you don't need to configure it externally explicitly. All right, all right. So there is something called as at the rate Spring Boot application. So what what does uh, this annotation do internally? Uh, so this at the rate Spring Boot application annotation is a combination of three different annotations. One is at the rate uh, component scan, other is at the rate uh, auto configuration, and then we have at the rate enable auto configuration. So these are three different annotations which are required to configure your Spring Boot application. And Scan the components which are there in your Spring Boot application. So basically, it helps you to configure your Spring Boot application, and you can simply uh, uh, run your uh, Java class which contains that Spring Boot application annotation and the main method. So you can simply right click and uh, run uh, the Java application or uh, Spring Boot application by in the main method. 
Okay. Okay. Uh, there's something called as component scan. Uh, can you tell me what is the use of this annotation? Uh, uh, this basically used to scan all the components which are there uh, in your uh, uh, application. So basically, it can take a parameter like uh, you can provide a base package. So if you provide us base package, it will scan all the components which are available inside that base package. And uh, uh, those components will be available for you to use in your screen application. Okay. Um, can you let me know or can you tell me how uh, is the Spring Boot application started? Uh, yeah. So uh, when you run your uh, application uh, by using uh, my method, or you can just uh, right click uh, the class which contains your my method that brings up your application. So in the back end, uh, what happens? Uh, that application gets started. Uh, it uh, gets deployed on your Tomcat, and uh, the application uh, is available for you. That means it gets started uh, by deploying it on Tomcat. All right. OK. Uh, so you know we can create a web application in Spring Boot. But can we create non-web application in Spring Boot? Is it allowed? Uh, yes, uh, we can create a non-web application as well. Uh, you just need to remove the dependency which is related to Spring Boot starter web dependency. Basically, that web dependency is used to create a web application. So if you remove that dependency, it will be a Spring Boot standalone application. We can call it as a non-web application. All right. OK. Uh, so that sounds good. Uh, there's an annotation at the rate rest controller. What is the significance of uh, that annotation in uh, in Spring Boot? Uh, so if you mention a class by using at the rate rest controller annotation, uh, that becomes your a controller class. So whenever there is a request from a client side, it will search the path inside uh, that controller. Uh, basically, the endpoints are searched inside this uh, REST controller, and this REST controller is a combination of a direct controller plus response body. So you don't need to write explicitly a direct response body annotation to indicate that uh, your uh, method is going to produce a data which is in JSON or XML format. So if you write a direct REST controller, uh, it is combination of a direct controller and a direct response body annotation. So you don't need to explicitly mention a direct response body annotation on your uh, methods. All right. Okay. So that sounds good. Uh, one last question. Can you briefly tell me about uh, Spring Boot application flow? What is the flow of Spring Boot application? Uh, so we have normally uh, different uh, layers, like uh, we can have a UI, uh, or we can call it as a client application. Then uh, you have a uh, controller layer, service layer, and repository layer. So whenever there is a request from UI or client, it goes to controller layer. From controller layer, I invoke service layer. And from service layer, I invoke repository layer, where I perform uh, database-related operations. Then I send back a result back to the service layer. In service layer, if there is any operation or business logic I need to write or if I need to perform any business related operations, then I do it in service layer and send the response back to the controller layer. And from that controller layer, the response goes back to the client. So that is basically uh, how the request gets executed in Spring Boot application. All right, perfect. That sounds uh, great. So I, I think that's it from my side. Do you have any questions from your side? Uh, no, I don't have a question. All right. So I'll share your feedback uh, with the uh, HR and HR will get back to you. Uh, thank you for joining the interview. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.